Hey there, welcome back to the channel. In the part 1 video, I developed my custom Mr. FPGA mounter PCB. In this second video, I am finally assembling all the custom PCBs I designed specifically for this project. From the rear I.O. to the front controller ports and power routing, everything has been carefully engineered to fit perfectly inside the classic dandy case. So grab a beverage and just sit back and relax as I put together the final pieces of this unique Mr. FPGA build. Starting from the bottom, I decided to put a filter near the vents so as to not allow any bugs or small insects to crawl inside. This filter fit snugly and I used double sided tape to secure it in its position. And uh, I also had a cutout in the middle of the filter where it, it would uh, just fit alongside a small post which was inside the plastic shell. I then installed the push button switch on the left hand side and routed the wires from the left hand side. These wires are solid core wires and they retain their shape once they are set in a shape. So uh, they are quite flexible and strong at the same time. The push button uh, switch are the ones which came original with the dandy console and I just reused them. I also installed the rear IO board which contains the power module and the AV jacks. The power switch is connected to the power module using a JST2 connector. This power module has a single 5 volt rail which separately powers the Mr. FPGA and the connector peripherals. I then install the spring which is used for the cartridge eject mechanism. Installing the mounter PCB was uh, a big process because it involved me first installing the plastic part and then uh, I have to route it and guide it pro properly so that it fits the, the uh, spring mechanism and uh, at the same time we have to make sure that the uh, Mr. FPGA sits properly in the shell and the DC jack is plugged in. Installing this part actually takes patience and time because it's a little bit tricky as you have to take care of many moving parts at the same time. Once the front I.O. board PCB is installed, I install the alternate power rail and the connection to the power switch. Now I will install the cartridge well and I have uh, made a small cutout on the well for a switch that will switch between NTSC and PAL. Essentially this is for the composite video where a notch filter is installed so the user can select between NTSC and PAL and the correct notch filter will be applied. Installing the cartridge well is easy, we just pull out the bar which supports the cartridge eject mechanism, lift the PCB up a little bit and just slide it in. After making sure that everything fits perfectly, I start putting in the screws for the front PCB. Once the front PCB is secured, I put in the reset switch. This reset switch is configured to show the on-screen display menu when pushed. Now comes my favorite part of this mod. I'm going to install the LEDs, mainly the power LED, the user LED and the disk read LED onto the system. But I'll not do it in a conventional way. I'll install the LEDs right beside the switches, the power switch and the reset switch. So when the system is turned on, the LED besides the 
power switch will glow white and the LEDs beside the reset switch will glow orange or blue. The orange one is for disk read and blue is for the user LED. After this I installed the RF cable that will carry the audio and video signals from the main PCB to the rear IO PCB. These cables will carry the left channel, the right channel, analog audio and the CVBS and Chroma and Luma analog video signals. Now some people would say that this is an overkill but I wanted to use shielded cables wherever possible inside the system so as to avoid any crosstalk or any interference with the analog signals. After this I installed the HDMI extension cable that will route the HDMI signals from the Mr. FPGA to the rear I.O. board. The system can now output both analog video and digital video with this setup. I later realized and added some dual sided tape to secure the LEDs right next to the power and reset buttons. And now all connections are complete and it's time to close the shell. Now this is the customization where the LEDs will help. I designed transparent button caps for the power and reset buttons. 3D printed them in clear resin for that crisp retro futuristic look. With LEDs mounted right beside them, the entire button cap will light up beautifully when the system is powered on. Or when there is a disk access or user LED indication. And now it was time to smoke test the machine. I hooked up the display to my 14 inch PVM uh, using CVBS and S-Video and I also connected it to my LCD TV using HDMI so that we can test all the ports. And now it was time to turn on the system but before turning on the system I decided to turn on the LCD TV and the Sony PBM. So I just turn it on it so it shows uh, HDMI not connected no signal then I turn on the PBM and now let's turn on the system and as you can see the LEDs are working beautifully. So as soon as I turn it on, it starts glowing and the disk access LED is also lighting up uh, showing the read access to the SD card. And the PVM shows uh, the menu but uh, right now it is, uh, I'm using a custom display timing which is causing the HDMI to show uh, unsupported signal. I have actually added multiple different Mr. INI files so that I can switch between them uh, as required. Right now it is set to show a higher resolution uh, CVBS image. It is a custom display timing just for the menu so that when I run some scripts I can see the output of the scripts as well on the PVM. Now all this display timing configuration is saved in the Mr. INI and this can be changed on the fly using this menu. So right now we have selected the main INI file which actually outputs to CVBS only and I can select uh, both which will output to CVBS and the HDMI. So a uh, certain display timing is being used which can uh, which the HDMI device can also un understand and the PVM can also un understand. So that's how uh, we can get picture in both the LCD TV and on the PVM. So both the analog and digital outputs are working together. 
which is a good thing. Now let's load up a core and I can show you how it behaves. The menu system on the PVM is actually black and white, but once we load up a core, it switches to the correct color timings as per the core. So right now it has switched to NC, uh, an NTSC Genesis. The exact timing for an NTSC system is being used. And as you can see, we have the uh, unique rainbow effect that we see in the Genesis console, Genesis or the Mega Drive console. So I've loaded up a game and it is uh, being displayed on both the HDMI and the PVM. Uh, and let's just check it out. Looking at the colors on both the digital and analog signal, it seems that there is absolutely no interference and signal quality is quite clean. As you can see there, we can see visible scan lines. Well, it's a PVM, so scan lines would be visible, but we also see that the changing the changes in colors are, are quite uh, sharp and the signal is very sharp. Now let us try to switch between the S video and the CVBS signal at this point just to see how different S video looks. So right now it is CVBS and I just switched to S video. As you can see at the top the head menu clears up quite a bit and we see there are no rainbow in artifacts anymore. But as soon as we change to CVBS we see that the rainbow artifacts start showing up. Also, as programmed, the reset button actually brings up the OSD menu where the player can adjust the core settings or select another core to play or any other ROMs to play. So this is all that I have for this video, but in the next video we are going to work on it further and improve the aesthetics of the system. Thank you for being with me and watching this video until the end. Please like, share and subscribe for more videos.